Hello, and welcome to Stowe Talks, a series of videos designed to support people going through a relationship breakdown and all of the challenges this brings. I'm Matthew Taylor. And I'm Lisa Gatchell, family lawyers at Stowe Family Law. And in each episode, we bring in some of the amazing professionals we work with so they can share their advice and expertise on a range of issues from co-parenting to financial advice to dealing with challenging ex-partners. Today, we're joined by Tom Nash, an internationally certified life, divorce and business coach, as he shares his advice on how to become a successful co-parent following separation and navigate the challenges of a blended family. Tom specialises in divorce, separation and family coaching, and is one of a handful of male divorce coaches in the UK. He's accredited by the Association for Coaching and holds Master Practitioner certifications in neuro-linguistic programming, timeline therapy, hypnotherapy and more. He supports people to overcome negative emotions, increase confidence and emotional well-being through one-to-one coaching, couples and uncoupling coaching, and coaching for co-parenting and blended families. Tom is also a co-founder of the Divorce Coaching Academy with Sue Palmer Con, our previous guest, training the next generation of divorce coaches to diploma level. He is an experienced keynote speaker, YouTuber, and podcast host of the Divorce Coaching Podcast. On a personal front, Tom has experienced divorce, co-parenting, and the related ups and downs from a young age, first during his parents' acrimonious divorce at the age of three years old, and later in life as a husband and father in his own marital breakdown. Today, he has a respectful and mutually beneficial working partnership with his ex-wife and a happy, successfully blended family. Welcome, Tom, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So it'd be great if we could just start with a bit of your own personal background and what led you to get into the world of divorce coaching and how your own personal experiences kind of formed that. Yeah, uh, I was retraining coaching at the time already um, and undergoing neurolinguistic programming and various other vocations. Uh, whilst I was still in my previous industry, um, my kind of former life, I ran recruitment businesses in the city for about 15 years. Uh, and it was actually through going through the process of my own divorce um, and the divorce process and the financial forms and working with lawyers, etc., and mediation process, um, but then also being a litigant in person for child arrangement orders. Uh, and it's going through that process that actually made me realise that you could utilise these skills in a in a different way. I was originally going to use them in the corporate space and do corporate wellbeing. Um, in actual fact, it was my my partner, my girlfriend, that said, "Why didn't you see if uh, you could utilise these skills for coaching other, particularly men, going through a divorce mm-hmm. process, uh, so they can understand it, learn how to deal with the emotions, etc." So we sat on the sofa one night and Googled it and uh, lo and behold found out that divorce coaching was actually a thing. It's a real job that people do. (laughs) Um, But scrolling through a couple of pages, what I couldn't find, and this is only three years ago, um, was any men doing it. Mm -hmm. I couldn't find any men being represented in terms of divorce coaching, any men talking about the emotional journey, the practical journey, uh, what to expect, the highs, the lows, the mental health impacts, all of it really, as well as the practical ones. Um, so it's that kind of, it really kicks off it really. And that mixed with growing up as a, a child of divorced parents and growing up in a blended family as well was something that just made me realise that you could do this differently um, and ultimately in a more positive way for, for the children. Can I ask, how did you find your experience of mediation in the court proceedings? Oh, that's a good question I wasn't anticipating. Um, (laughs) Mediation, fine. Um, I did attend my mediation and got my my AMS certificate, um, but my now ex-wife didn't. Um, So we actually didn't get into the full mediation process, unfortunately. Um, The court process, um, the finances are slightly different because I did that through uh, through, uh, with a solicitor who's also actually processing my my, my divorce and I was the respondent, Uh, I wasn't the applicant. Um, But actually going through the court process for the child arrangement orders, um, I was very, very lucky to be honest with you. Uh, My partner, uh, my girlfriend, she had previously studied law, Um, not matrimonial law, but she knew how to structure a case, what Mm. to look for, how to look for inconsistencies, etc, things like that, because I know it's about to change imminently, um, uh, but the kind of association of blame side of things was, and having to build that case, if you like, that pack or bundle, whatever you want to call it, uh, that was, I, I couldn't get my head around that. I knew my story and I knew what I was experiencing, um, but being a litigant, litigant in person and, and self-representing in the court was 
really, really scary. I mean, I'll be honest with you, I anticipated going in and being this old school oak wooden room with a judge. <laughs> like, like the telly. The yeah, yeah, the absolutely. Yeah. yeah, like I've the been gavel. taught from yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I was expecting. Um, and it was this nondescript office block um, in the middle of Bedfordshire <laughs> <laughs> um, with three magistrates and not a drudge. Um, so that was, that was really different to what I'd expected. Um, but then also because I was uh, self-representing, my, my ex-wife had a, a, uh, had a barrister. So I was obviously negotiating back and forth with the barrister. And I remember we were supposed to be in court, I think for 10 o'clock we, was, we were supposed to be in. We were still negotiating and I called past four. Mm -hmm. And this poor guy was going back and forth. Yeah. Um, and I still remember to this day that when I'd actually left, uh, when we'd left court uh, that day, I remember bumping into him um, at the Zebra Crossing and walking back to the car park. Uh, and I did make a point of stopping him and just shaking his hand and saying that I know that you weren't representing for me, but thank you because I appreciate you being really respectful for me today, mm -hmm. having just been by myself. Um, but no, it's really, really daunting. It's really, really scary. And this whole process, you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And it's all new to the people involved, mm. um, uh, to, to the individuals involved. And it's all this information is coming at you thick and fast, both practical, legal, financial, emotional, and you, it's just really overwhelming. You're just kind of drowning in information and you don't really know where to start. So again, that was one of the other things that divorce coach mixed with legal representation, mixed with a financial expert, can really help people unpack all of that and to kind of lower the anxieties, mm. calm the stresses, make it bite size and break it down. So knowing what you know now and mm -hmm. how you have moved on, and obviously we'll get to that, and you know the, the relationship that you have now with your children and your ex-partner and your girlfriend and how all of that works, is there anything that you would have done differently in far, as far as the, the court proceedings were concerned? Uh, yes, um, and it's the one thing that I work extensively with my clients to try and help them with, which is trying to get out of my own way. Mm -hmm. um, stop creating the obstacles that aren't already there or making the mountains out of a molehill or just little bits of contentiousness for the sake of it those little small battle wins because actually ultimately it didn't really help overall do you mean, do you mean that in terms of the sort of the blame game Th yeah. throwing that extra bit of mud because there's yeah. something that you've always kind of argued about or a little point just, yeah it. just trying yeah. to get that one that that little one percent one one man upmanship because overall it doesn't actually matter it doesn't actually help um and especially if you, for, for parents, uh, and my area of focus and passion, um, working with parents and blended families and co-parenting, is ultimately the between the separating parties or divorcing parties, there is no, you don't get one winner and a loser, do you? And that's what everyone thinks they're trying to win. Mm -hmm. You get a winner or a loser, and it, ultimately it's your children. Mm -hmm. And you as the parents get to decide if they win or if they lose. And that comes from your action or in some cases inaction. Um, but like I say, trying to, get out of your own way, not create mm. further contentiousness and animosity where maybe there isn't, because again, that's the other thing, is people latch onto the next thing to either get revenge, retaliation, etc., whatever it might be. Um, but yeah, that would be the, the biggest thing, is not create a lot of my own problems. Yeah. So when you've been through the court proceedings, and you, yeah. you, you walk away with your final order, your child arrangements order, and begin to put that in effect. How does that then change your relationship and how do you work on that relationship with your ex-partner and, and kind of you know build build the new relationship yeah. the way that me and my ex-wife are now uh, and the way that we organize the kids and work with each other is so far detached from what's written in our order <laughs> um, it, there's nothing is aligned um, and fortunately we have never very, maybe in the very early days, we never had to go back to and resort to the phrase of "it's in the order." Yeah. So this is Wa waving happen. that bit of paper. Yeah, yeah. Right. this is what we're this is what we're going to do. Um, it is a transition. It does take a period of time, and again, it, depending on which side of, I suppose, that order you've fallen on, whether you feel that you have lost or whether you feel that you've given concessions or whatnot, um, will be a bit of a, will be a bit of a change, and, a, uh, uh, and we'll, again, will take some of that time, mm -hmm. but. The other thing is, once that's done and that, that, that battle, that fight, as people call it, is kind of out the way, you actually get the chance to kind of sit back and go, right, OK, so actually, how, how do we now make this work? How do we make this real and not just what's been written down here? Now that everybody else has left, I'm, I'm, not, working, I'm not speaking to the barrister every day and so on and so forth, how do you actually make this work? Um, and I think one of the other 
biggest changes is also where to start to look for new opportunities to rebuild that trust. Because that's one of the big things is you've, you've got to find a new working partnership. I always describe it when I'm working with um, clients who are maybe in professional roles, for example, I might say, have you ever worked with someone who was absolutely the best person for the project, but you couldn't stand them? <laughs> you don't want to go to the pub with them after work on a Friday, and you're not interested in their personal life, but you know they've got the unique set of skills that they're the best person for this job. Mm. Well, that's exactly the same with this situation, because the two of you are ultimately the most important people to the children. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's about you utilising both of your strengths where, where, where applicable. Um, and again, you can even get really finite with that. So for argument's sake, um, I'm more the creative. I'm more the imagination and think up random things and invent stuff. Um, I am not good with the core English science <laughs> space. <laughs> so that wouldn't be my area of expertise homework-wise with the kids or mm, where to assist yeah. them or where to flourish in that unique thing that, 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 that that's important to, to that particular child. So it is about finding those new ways of trust and, and working together, yeah, definitely. Okay. And in terms of the sort of blended family, perhaps you could talk a bit about that. I mean, firstly, for anyone who's not aware who's joining us, what is a blended family? What, what makes yeah. a blended family? Uh, so a blended family is where two parties come together and either one or both of them have a child or children from a, a previous relationship. So I, I grew up in a blended family. It wasn't called that in 1986. Um, in fact, I don't know what it was called then. <laughs> but um, So I grew up with, I've got two, two sisters who share both the same biological parents. I had three stepbrothers and then my dad and my stepmom had one together. So okay. I have a half-brother as well. Um, so I grew up in that environment from a very young age. Uh, but I also have, so I've got two boys from my first marriage. I also have my two bonus children, so I don't use the term step, um, or I try not to, everybody else uses it, but I tend to go with uh, with bonus children um, in Leonie and Zach, um, my partner's children from her first marriage. And then the unique thing about our situation is you, you need like a CSI board to write <laughs> this out, but... My ex-wife's boyfriend is my girlfriend's ex-husband. <laughs> okay, so one more time, Sally, because yeah, no, so I'm actually imagining a board with red string. Yeah, yeah. So, so your ex- so my ex-wife, her boyfriend Daniel, yes, is my girlfriend's ex-husband. Okay, so the parents wow. have effectively all swapped around. So in that scenario, <laughs> where each original marriage, because um, none of we none of us got remarried, uh, both had two children yep. each. So this, there's this little collective melting pot of four kids that are going between the alternate two homes, but in each set, in each home, they've got the reverse set of parents. So again, if you've in that situation, ours is very unique that all four adults have a huge emotional attachment and investment in this scenario. There's no independent yeah. party on the periphery mm-hmm. going, "Hey, stop, think about this for a minute," or "What might this be?" So if, all that contentiousness was just heightened. Um, if you like, um, and had the opportunity and at times did get higher as well. So, yeah, but that's that, that's pretty much how a blended family works. So that must have been quite interesting at the beginning then. I mean, how how long do you think it took to work through all of that and get to a point where you can, I don't know, have, have birthdays, parties together, etc.? Yeah. Uh, they set, it depend, The thing is, there's so many different variables. So it depends on things like the kids' ages mm. as well. So if you've got... A difference in ages if you've got like ones that are older teenagers 15 16 17 and the other person's got one or two that are five and mm-hmm. three there's going to be a difference there because there's also going to be different parenting styles and things like that um i mean it's after you take the average says it takes around sort of three to five years dependent on a lot of those kind of moving parts uh ours was probably about three years um that took to come through that uh, and get to a place where actually we could share birthdays, share Christmases. It's my ex-wife's, well, it was my ex-wife's 40th birthday last week, and me and my girlfriend and Dan uh, are taking her away this weekend for her 40th, so we, without the kids. So now we actually do stuff as mm. a four, um, which is really cool. But And again, it's, it's, it's the difference that you get to see in the kids as well, now that they've got four parents mm. to go to for whatever it is that they need or a particular situation um, or something that's going on in their lives that they feel safer talking to one or whatever. And then between the four of us that we we can all work together. Um, but even down to like simple things, like someone's forgotten their PE kit, right? rather than just me or my partner having to sort it out, 
there's two extra people we can go yeah. and call upon, uh, yeah. which makes it really, really helpful. Um, but yeah, it, it's the other thing is it does take a lot of effort. It takes a lot of consistency. Patience is a big one as well. But it also takes someone or a series of people to start doing things differently as mm -hmm. well. So I always remember the first time um, that anything kind of shifted away from the the bitterness and the contentiousness um, was actually uh, a time that we'd invited um, Dan in for dinner. There was something going, I can't remember, it was something at work or something like that. Um, but I knew he wasn't in a pretty good place and we, I just said to Dan, I was like, go outside, invite him in for dinner. Um, don't take no for an answer because she very rarely does. Um, <laughs> and she went out and she said, Dan Park truck, come up in for dinner. And he said something along the lines of, no, it will be weird. And verbatim, Donna's response was, it'll only be weird if you make it weird. Mm. So we came in, he sat down, and it was the weirdest dinner I've ever had in my <laughs> life. <laughs> um, but you also have to get through that weirdness. Yeah. Nothing's going to change unless you try to make it different, unless you try to approach it differently. Mm. All four of us could have sat on our hands and not done anything different, not offered an olive branch at every opportunity, not supported the kids relationship it's all too easy to just when a kid turns around and goes actually i don't want to go to mum's or i don't want to go to dad's okay cool mm. and actually supporting that and going no no, no you, you need to go and you need to keep building that bond and that relationship um to start getting back to that place of trust we were talking about where mm. you can rebuild the this new united front where actually you do get to support each other um but that that also comes down to like daily little things as well so even now when i walk through the door at um, to my ex-wives if I've heard her say to the boys like get your school, get your school shoes on get ready for school and they've ignored her because they're hardwired into the Xbox or whatever they're doing mm -hmm. um, three strike rule if we still hit that three stages and they haven't answered mum I, I've, I've still got a duty to, sh to back her up yeah. to teach my kids to respect their mum and actually step in and say boys listen to your mum put your shoes on apologise get to school and that's that consistency I guess that you're talking about so do you operate in your sort of your unit of the eight of you do you operate similar rules in both houses identical rules in both houses or do you kind of is there a bit of flex because obviously you've each got your own roles and we'll have your own yeah, slightly yeah. different approaches how, how do you sort of negotiate those differences yeah yeah uh, so again like when you're talking about boundaries and rules and things like that that's absolutely fundamental is that planning phase of how this is going to work because all too often we don't and that's where we kind of fall down but you've got to look at those how they work uniquely to you so for example um a client that i was working with not too long ago him and his former partner are about an hour apart mum's mm. house is a five minute walk from the school dad's is an hour's drive mm. so at dad's they do need to go to bed early there's no point in them going to bed at nine o'clock like they do at mum's because they've got to get up an hour earlier so again you've got to try to find those unique things that work to, to your situation um but yeah we have a number of kind of baseline level ground rules when it comes to homeworks bedtimes chores behaviors um, etc. Uh, but likewise, you've then also got to look for nuances where you do slight, things slightly different. And part of that, I call it the ultimate blended family because it's across these two homes, is also where you, it's not just about the rules and, the, uh, and those boundaries and things like that. It's also about new traditions. Mm -hmm. um, because I think about being a blended family is how you're making it a family, um, how you're making it inclusive. Uh, and how you how you creating those family bonds and those family ties? Um, we've all got children, yeah. you know that 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 love as a child and as a parent is unconditional. With a non biological connection, it, it's not. It is conditional. So you mm. need to work at it, mm. um, and you do need to be engaged, and you need to be involved. You need to show up, and that's one of the other big things when you set those rules and those boundaries. Is when there's a break or in the, or a break, break in the chain, and inaction that's when some of that contentiousness and et cetera can come back. Because if you haven't seen through the thing you're supposed to be doing to back it up, um, then you're not being supported. It's interesting, actually, what you were talking about as far as traditions are concerned, because I certainly find, I don't know if Matt's the same, that clients get very stuck yeah. on their family traditions and the things that they had growing up and then the ones that they came together with in the marriage. And mm. there are some of those that when you're separated, you can't continue with post-separation. For example, Christmas Day is yep. always a big one. Mm -hmm. um, you know, nobody wants to give up the, the Christmas Eve, Christmas Day. But in reality, you can't unless... You know, you perhaps in your situation, but I would say yours is quite unique <laughs> we at do. the moment. I hope we that We didn't always, forward. though, so you're absolutely right. Um, yeah. You have to navigate a new tradition as to, yeah. you know, 
when how, how you spend that time yeah. um you know, I often say to clients, I mean, children are quite happy to have two Christmases. <laughs> they don't know which <laughs> yeah. day is the 25th of December. You know, you just, you, ha- you know, you have your Christmas day on, on the 26th of December and they'll be quite happy. Mm. Um, what advice do you give to people surrounding that? Yeah. But again, it's, a, it's about which lens you're looking through, which yeah. viewpoint you're looking at. Is it a case of something's being taken away or is it something you can go towards? So in that respect... So how could you make a new tradition out of it? If it's that they're going to go to the other parents, let's say, on Christmas morning, well, if you've still got Christmas Eve, how could you build in a new tradition for you in terms of doing... uh, So we used to do um, Christmas Eve boxes. Mm -hmm. So that would be, like, uh, a new onesie, a mug, some hot chocolate sort of thing, whatever it might be, because the next day they were going to go to the other parents. But it's about looking for, okay, so how can I use this to my advantage? How can I make this an opportunity to create something... Um, and, and approach that differently. But again, it's a lot of the work that I do is helping people to change that point of view, mm-hmm. change that perspective, see it differently, um, and get past the anger, the hurt, the resentment, the guilt, even um, as well, and start to change that point of view. Because it's also interesting when people are arguing over the house as well, mm-hmm. and the, ma- the, ma- the, the family home. Um, and I know you guys probably know, but the statistics around. Uh, within the first 18 months of the financial order etc going through and if someone's bought someone out and kept the family home they move anyway yeah. because now they've got the right we've kept the tradition we've kept the family home everything goes through and then they sit and pause for a moment take a breath real life settles in they look around and go i don't want to be surrounded by these old memories yeah it's actually incredible. i want to go and move yeah. and start some new memories mm-hmm. so again it's about seeing it as opportunity and just shifting that that perspective and how do you deal with and how do you advise your male clients to deal with the thing that I hear quite a lot um, from my male clients, from my dads, is that threat, that fear of another man coming in. Yeah. And it's a very male thing, I think. And I don't know, I think me. women are the same. Do you, do you it's like, no, she can't, she can't mother my children. You know, and society, I mean, the stepmum. How yeah, do the, we the view the stepmom? Disney the stepmom step-mom is yeah. wicked, yeah. In everything yeah. that we see, particularly in Disney films that we watch from a very young yeah. age, as soon as we look at the stepmom, she is evil. She's so evil. So it's really difficult yeah. to then, you know, move from that to a really positive view of it. Yeah. And how, it, how do you it, negotiate that initial, that threat? Because that, it's all fear-based, isn't yeah. it, from both? Yeah, and, yeah you're absolutely yeah, right. Absolutely. It's mums and dads feeling that fear. How do you build through that with clients? Helping them to, again, individually and how that, how thing how you work and represent with different people and what works for them as well um but it is about helping them to unpack what what is it they're actually scared of and it's usually around a feeling of loss of lack of control or input or importance and hierarchy and all that all that sort of stuff um but like you say those, those fears are very rarely founded um uh, at all and it's also about respecting those positions of that, that new person that is going to be in their life so um, he's going to kill me for saying this, but my dad uh, had said to me, um, bless him, uh, my dad had said to me in the really early days of my own personal situation, he actually said those words, how are you going to feel one day when Sam, my youngest, who was what, five at the time, um, he's a cuddly, cuddly kid, he's yeah. like, how are you going to feel one day when Sam goes running over and jumps into the arms of another man, gives him a big hug? Mm. I said, sorry, are you asking me if I'm going to be annoyed that someone else in the world other than me loves and cares about my son? Surely the more people that love and care and support him, the safer he'll be, the further he'll go, the more opportunities he'll have. That can only be a good thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but again, it's just try helping to step back from what you're not losing. Mm-hmm. Um, and like you were saying about the, the, the Disney mums um, that are always, or Disney stepmums that are always portrayed as being wicked and evil. Likewise, the, um, the single dads in Disney movies, or I'm not just picking on Disney here, yeah. but similarly, um, single dads are only ever single dads when they're heroes because of a loss of a tragedy because yeah. mum's always died. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we're, we're already taught from a really young age these things. Likewise, let's go, not even Disney, EastEnders or something like that. What happened, what are we told by the media? When a, a family separates and there's a family breakdown, mum will typically get, have the support of her nearest and dearest and she'll rally around the kids and all the rest of it. Dad will go off and drink too much go off the rails, sleep around, get in fights, etc. live in a bed sit. And it, it's just not portrayed in the right way. But again, that's all perpetuates this fear of what's mm-hmm. going to happen. Um, but well, you get the two presentations with uh, single dads, because it's either 
the sort of sort of feckless dad who's not really involved and doesn't do much. Or you get, so I'm married and I've got two kids. The other weekend, my wife went away she, for, with her friends, a bit of a break and things, mm. and I had the kids on my own for two, and it's two days with my own kids. It's like great fun. Like knackering, but great fun. And there's something like, oh, are you going to be okay? I'm like, I'm the dad. It's fine. Yeah. Like, I'm oh. not babysitting. You but get, you also you get, get yeah. praise. You get it's praise like, oh, it. isn't he a good dad? He's, he's good dad. dropped where, where, his kids off at school, you know. Yeah. Oh, she's a bit late. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. You, it's no, easier yeah. to get the praise as the dad for doing yeah. what is should be absolutely ba- the bare minimum. Yeah. Whereas the mum's like, well, if I'm, I'm currently away for work filming this. Yeah. And it's like, oh, well. You know, yeah. mum will sort it. So, so you, it's quite, an, it's an interesting approach. So you get, get those two presentations yeah. of the dads as well, I think. But again, that was one of the things that when I went through, again, going through my own personal experience, it was I had stopped and reevaluated what was important to me. So what did it, what was it really important to me? What did I really want? And actually I'd spent all these years building this big career to have the lifestyle I thought I was supposed to do, because yeah. that's what society says and all the rest of it. Um, to spend very little time with my my kids or even indeed my then wife at the time um at the weekend mm. um and it was then that made me reevaluate and go actually do you know what that's not the bit that's really important to me i was doing all of that to create this lifestyle for them but actually what i wanted was time with them mm. um and i wanted to step back and do something one that i'm passionate about with helping other people get through this positively but also i want to do the school run i want to iron the uniform i Want to be involved? Really? I want to go a little. I am the uniform. Yeah, that's a, that's I'm a one of those. Mine if you want. <laughs> I'm, I'm one of those weird people. I love iron. <laughs> My iron hasn't been out the cupboard in a few months. <clears> I'm not going to lie. <laughs> um, I, th- I think that um, the, the difficulty that some people have when they're with clients is that they can't. I suppose it's about getting in their own way. Is mm. that they are so consumed with bitterness towards their ex partner. Yeah. That, that they can't get past that to get to the stage of having a of making those little initially little and yeah. but feel enormous sacrifices those yeah. those initial steps how do you work with someone who's so sort of still so in it and so consumed by the sort of negative feelings to yeah. move to something that is because all because a lot of the the advice that you give is astoundingly positive i think and yeah. and, and latching on to positive how do you move from the negative to the positive yeah no uh well first off i'd use various different forms of actual coaching and then like things like neuro, uh, neuro-linguistic programming, time run therapy in terms of helping them unpack that emotion. Because if you think about the um, like the higher level version of anger, and if you look underneath and then start unpacking it and peeling away those kind of layers, you get to understand what it actually is to them. So it might be disappointment, it might be humiliation. So when you get into that grass root of what is the actual negative emotion, then they can actually understand that once you got to the understanding point, you can actually learn what you can do with it and how you evolve from it. So rather than just going, well, I'm angry or I'm annoyed or, okay, so what is it you're specifically annoyed about? How can you do it? What could you do differently? What could, what needs to change? Or sometimes what do you also need to hear sometimes? Because some of that's the closure side or the acknowledgement of something that's happened as well. So is that still a conversation that still hasn't been had or that you feel that you still need um, to help them move forward from there? When it comes to co-parenting and how to help people move out of that angst and that anger and that phase of things, it's also about trying to help them shock the system a little bit, but also to be a bit longer term, bigger picture. So I always say like a divorce or separation where children are involved, it's multi-generational. This carries on for, 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 for decades um, and longer. Um, so I always say to people, forget co-parenting, forget who's got little Timmy on every second Thursday. And I say, how do you want a co-grandparent? How do you want it to be when your three kids have three kids and you've now got nine first birthdays, nine future graduations, etc.? How do you want that to be for your adult children when they have to decide which one of you is coming, which one's coming along? And how do you want that to be then for your grandchildren as well? When you start to go, oh my God, this isn't just an immediate day-to-day thing that I have to live with. This is going to be every day as well, um, just to help them get past where they were. And it's about... That, that moving forward so I mean I, I run my practice on three core values of uh, understand evolve and improve everybody wants to improve they all want it to be better and well, the whole point about making it better is you've got to evolve you've got to change mm-hmm. you've got to do something different and if that's uncomfortable isn't it change really is uncomfortable. uncomfortable it's not an easy yeah. thing to do and the other thing is everyone else is thinking well they need to change yeah. how do I get them to change doing that mm-hmm. well, you can't because you can't control anybody else I can't make you pick that glass of water up Only you can do that. Mm. But what you can do is control yourself and your approach to that um, and and how you look for maybe solution-driven options 
um, as opposed to dictating, which again can bring up a lot of things like you're going to do this on this day. Well, they hate that. No, I'm not I think that. that's the problem. If, if people think they're being told when they can spend time with their children, yeah, they, they immediately the the barriers go up, and you can you can see that they're you just you're never going to get an agreement if you get that kind of dictating letter. Well, and that's kind of borne out in the court system, isn't it? Because yeah. the stats suggest that agreements reached by negotiation, whether it's through the court system and the settled that court or it's mediation, they, they're abided by a lot more closely. Mm-hmm. Whereas something that's imposed by the court, by a judge, by the magistrates, mm. they go wrong more frequently. I think mm-hmm. I certainly see that. In yeah, practice. absolutely. The other difficulty is, is um, and a lot of the work is also helping people who maybe haven't yet done the self-reflection work and actually now they've realised they, they need to rectify it. So I have a lot of clients that come to me, men and women, that say, I, I used to do this or I've previously done that, I, I, I want to change it, I don't know how, or I, now I want to be a more present parent or I want to be more involved, I've lost that time, I can't get it back. But it's also now having to, again, going back to rebuilding the, the trust side of things because that's never been the situation, mm. because mm. he or she never took them to school. You get the other parent going, well, they're never used to, so why are they going to do it now? I have, I have, I, that is a barrier that I come up against quite a lot is... Yeah. You know, the the makeup of the marriage mm. was that one parent did the majority. And so when it breaks down, they expect, well, my role will stay the same and yep. there'll be a weekend dad in, in those circumstances, perhaps. Um, but when that parent then does a lot of work and decides, oh, actually, that's not what I want to be, it can be very difficult for the parent that has done a lot of the... Yep. The, the graft, if you like, up until yeah. that point to step back and let the other parent come into that space and take a bit yeah. more responsibility. Because it's interesting, because so I get asked quite a lot about the type of clients that I also get as well. And because of doing co-parenting and blended families, I, I get the whole spectrum of, and I imagine you guys do as well, I get a lot of dads that want to be more present and involved and engaged. I get some mums that don't because of the way it's always been. I actually also get quite a lot of mums that come to me saying, I want him to be more oh, involved. Those, those that, are the worst clients because you can't make someone It's so be frustrating. Yeah. And yeah. for the, these poor, you know, these poor mums, it's like, I'm desperate for some help. Yeah. And he just either won't or can't. And sometimes it's calm because of work circumstances. Yeah. You know, maybe they're in the armed forces or something and that, that's tr- tricky. Yeah. But yeah, that, they're, how do you deal with those? They're incredibly difficult. Really, really. Yeah, they are really, really difficult. Yeah. That's when you need to start looking at if it's physically impossible, they're in the forces, they're yeah. working on an oil rig, whatever it might be, they're physically not around. Then it's just looking at well, where what they're actually looking for is that little bit of respite. Mm. Where they've actually got a bit of their own time, so actually then it's just looking at how else could you create another option for that if the other parent physically isn't around, how else could you approach that? Yeah, and what if it's just a, they're not interested? Is there any way of dealing with that if, if, you, if you're just desperate for the help and the other party just... Again, the consistency, up? all you can do is continue to try because, again, you've still got to get the other party to engage yeah. at the end of the day. Sometimes it is also looking for that any window of opportunity, that first time that your former spouse says, I'm in a bit of a bind. My car's broke down, stuff yeah. at work, the train's whatever. Um, can you go and get this going? Absolutely. And the second you get that opportunity, when I was saying earlier about inaction, like the second you get that chance, then you go for it. And then you've got a window of opportunity to start rebuilding trust. Right? It's not about rubbing it in the face, but it's like, I'm, I'm still here, can still always do it, um, and, and making yourself available. And what about, um, we talked a lot about co-parenting and working together in similar ground rules. What about in circumstances where it's just not feasible at present and hopefully that'll change? Mm. Do you speak about parallel parenting? What's your view about that, about how, you know, having two sets of rules in two different houses, how, how that can work and how can that be done effectively? Yeah, no, it's sometimes you need to. It might be high conflict, it might be experiences of abuse, um, etc. It might just be the really early stages and the really early days and actually what you both need is just Mm. Bit of space. Mm. Go each go to your respective corners, um, <laughs> uh, and, and just take a minute um, and respectfully have your own set of rules and guidelines. But again, if it's then, do you then want to work back up to a, co- a co-parenting relationship? And co-parenting doesn't have to mean friends. I mean, I know my situation is quite unique in a, in a lot of experiences, um, but it's not the same friends it's just the prefix of the word co is about collaboration cohesive cooperative it's just been working together respect um, isn't it having yeah, just absolutely. a degree of respect for each other yeah yeah absolutely but i think it's then how do you build back up to that or even if you're going to stay in parallel parenting so again we're talking about people use the word boundaries all the time what does boundary actually mean well i always say uh, loads of little things like um tech can either be helpful or a hindrance so 
in this modern world, you could go and utilize there's various different parenting apps out there. They say co-parenting, but you could still use them for parallel parenting because you can still track communications and everything. But then you also streamline and centralize all forms of communication related to the children. So if that helps you to not be triggered by your email, your WhatsApp, whatever, going off on your phone, because I get clients quite a lot that say, they email me about, they email, they email me at this email, at my work email address about money. They email me on my personal address about parents evening. They text me about what time they're picking the kids up from school, etc. And they've got all these different avenues that they're being affected. They are being triggered by these mm. when it's uh, when the contentions are high. Um, so we'll say to them, like, okay, we'll streamline it, centralise it, stick it all in one place so that at least you're not being triggered in those other areas where you want to go on WhatsApp and talk to your yeah. Friends, I think that's incredibly helpful. I love the parenting apps. Mm. You know that mm. that and it there's a it's a it's an almost physical digital not rather than physical but digital compartmentalizing. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it slightly shifts the, yeah. the 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 mental approach. And it's almost like locking it there as a part of my brain now that is about yeah. communicating about the children. Yeah. Um, and you're not as you say yeah. it's not popping up in your WhatsApp chats when you. Even if you don't want an actual app, I've said to people before, have set up a separate yeah. email, mm. set up a brand new email that's. Timmy's parents at gmail.com or whatever, um, where everything gets centralised just for that. So it's not in the rest, because what you don't want to be doing is sitting at work or even at home if you're working from home and you've got all this stuff popping up in front of you and impacting the rest of your day. Um, and then where we say about boundaries is set days, times of the week, etc., whatever, where you go and check that. You might still need to have, obviously, phone calls for emergency if something really mm. bad happened. But apart from that, if, if things are, when you say like with the parallel parenting and people can't communicate um, respectfully, only go and have a look at that email every third day or whatever it might be, or once a week, um, or whatever that might be for them to again help just lessen the the anxieties and the stress levels around that, and um, to again give yourself a bit of respite and an opportunity for it to calm down. Mm. Um, but even so many other different things, whether it's, whether it's parallel parenting, co parenting, um, language is really, really important. So I said earlier about, um, you said, well, sorry, you said about Disney and I said about step. Mm. So I used the word bonus. So the word step comes from, I think it's an 8th eight, century Anglo-Germanic word, which actually is called uh, steop, which actually means orphan. Okay. So oh, the really? word step parent would be to take on a child that isn't yours. Mm. That's effectively where it is. So now it's kind of like, oh, well, I'm taking it under my wing, whereas that's where I say bonus kids, because I originally mm. had these two. Now I've got these extra ones. So language is really, really important. Um, and even down to, there's another saying that I always have, which is um, co-parenting, even parallel parenting, is no place for pronouns. So I'm all for pronouns. I have them all of my LinkedIn, my Instagram, <laughs> etc. But when you're talking about your former partner, your child's other parent, with she always does this, mm. he's always like that. It's quite aggressive, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Already, you're usually, the arms are crossed, mm. you're pointing down, you're frowning, the tone changes. Um, you're already, what you're doing is actually taking your anger, your hurt, etc., whatever that negative emotion is for you as the adult, and you're turning that into guilt for that child that they can't say mummy, daddy, etc., mm. in front of you. Um, so, yeah, I always say, like, no place for parents. If you've always called them mummy or you've always called them daddy or whatever it is, continue to do so mm. um, because it's about, about their experience. At the end of the day, you will only ever know if you've been a successful co-parent if your kids tell you that you were. Yeah. You, the parents don't get to decide. You, I don't get to decide if I'm a good co-parent. My kids get to decide if I'm a good co-parent. Yeah. It's their feedback and their evaluation of this situation that matters. It's similar as to how they hear you speaking about your ex-partner as well, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. Because um, kids pick up on so much, oh, yeah. even when you don't think they're in earshot. Yeah. And when you're making negative comments about your ex-partner, you know, from the child's perspective, you know, they're made up, they're half of you and half of them. So it's, yeah. well, am I that then? Because mm -hmm. you're saying he's yeah, that yeah. and he's, he's daddy, or you're saying mummy's that and I'm part of mummy. So does that mean that I'm, I'm that. that? And especially in those early days, because then they'll start to, because kids already start to question anyway, yeah. has, the, has this relationship broken down because of me? Yeah. What did I do? So if they're now already hearing you talking negatively about the other parent, and like you say, they're starting to say, well, is that me? Am I like that? Is that why they're not together? So this is my fault? And again, it's just building all of that up for them and not, and not, in, a, not in a positive way or it's going to have a positive outcome. But like you just said, it's also about how you're saying things. So if you take your 
communication strategy as a pie chart, only 7% of the words that you use. Uh, 55% is your body language. Um, so if you're ever in like a networking meeting or anything like that and someone's feet are pointing that way, mm. then they're not interested in what you're saying. <laughs> they're gone. Oh, um, I wonder why everyone always sat yeah. like that <laughs> <laughs> However, there are, there are caveats to that because, of course, like someone's saying that they're, they're not interested because they're folding their arms. I'm but often cold. I quite often Some people like are cold. I'm a cold person. Or someone yeah. might have hurt their arms. So actually yeah. they're actually supporting themselves. I'm sitting like that actually because I have a thing on my left hip so I can't cross my legs the other way. Mm. So actually that's not... I wasn't not, taking it personally. But I know, <laughs> no, I had to put that one out. But the other, but the other uh, 38% is how you're saying it. Mm. Pitch, tone, yeah. delivery. And this is the problem with written communication. Yes. And I think this is the problem with text messages and emails is that there's no context. Yeah. So you can say something and you type it away and you press send and you think it's perfectly reasonable but the person receiving that email interprets it in a completely different way in a completely different tone yeah. that was never yeah. intended yeah absolutely. or people do things in a hurry and don't think and they and you might read it back later and go yeah no that's yeah not, i think we're all guilty of that we'll do that certainly <laughs> well, even when you then go um dear catherine dear jonathan when you always use call them Cat or Kate yeah. or John or I, I, I don't know where I, I always put hey I never put hi or do I always put hey hey you're right but I always used to do it anyway in the daytime mm-hmm. like years ago and like, hey how's your day so I still do that now like hey I'll be there at half mm-hmm. past three um, rather than dear so and so I will be there at blah 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 make sure the kids are ready um, but again it's all just trying to lessen you need to yeah. soften things you see a lot of because we obviously get passed on a lot of text messages that go between clients and their partners, ex-partners, or and you, and you see a lot of people starting to try and write like solicitors in those messages, and it's just never a good thing. Yeah, it's and it's always. really easy to get into an argument via text messages, I think, yeah. and not yeah. realise it until you're 50 messages in, yeah. and you've got this big trail of messages, and you think, oh, what you were talking about is actually a really yeah. small yeah. issue that's just blown up because yeah. you've received a message you didn't like it, so you've sent, and it's just escalated and got yeah. worse. So the only other things is about the, the communication side of things is actually going for like round tables mm. um, or even just the two of you. I mean, if you've got slightly older children, um, older teenagers and it's related to something to do with them, then call, bring them along, get them involved and give them their voice. But if they're a bit younger and it's not appropriate to do so and involve them in the adult conversation, then just the two of you. But then it's looking at, well, and again, the planning side of things, where are you going to go? Where are you going to do this? because one of you might not feel very comfortable going back into the family home mm. or one of you might not want the other one back in mm. the family home. So actually, where could you go that is mutually exclusive ground? Go with a pre-agreed agenda, because that's the other thing. It escalates and starts going down the rabbit hole when you go off piste, mm. when you don't stick to what you're actually planning to talk about and then you go, oh, that, that other thing, because you forgot this or you didn't do that and blah, 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 and then it starts. So go with your pre-agreed agenda about that thing or things that you guys need to discuss, and work through, agree upon, etc. And go somewhere and set your, set your agenda and go for half an hour or an hour. I'm going to talk about this. And at the end of it, someone said, you have to, again, the boundary side of things, you have to make rules to respect each other as well. Mm-hmm. If one of you goes, oh, that other thing, sorry, if it's that important, stick you on next week's agenda. Um, in those earlier stages, but it becomes less formal further down the road as well because now it's just a case of sending a text message or, or doing it in the morning uh, having a chat in the morning but yeah and how do you manage things like holidays so particularly holidays abroad that can be a really yeah. tetchy subject about going you know taking the children unfortunately abroad. haven't been away haven't oh been yeah abroad. <laughs> i haven't um but again well we are planning one at, at, at the moment but again we split them but it, we Originally, it was a little bit more on the lines of the court order. Not yeah. that we ever waved the paper in each other, but we had agreed that we would split them down and we would do it alternately. So Christmas, New yeah. Year's, etc. cetera, um, uh, and how we'd split them down. But again, you've got to make them unique to your own situation. So if you've got one parent that's a teacher and is going to be off and has always typically done that and the other one works overseas or abroad or something, it might not work. But you've got to find a way for it to work to your unique situations. Um, but again, it's, yeah, a lot of the time it's about alternating. Um, and then, more importantly, what are you then going to do if it's not your Christmas? Because mm. the other, we were saying earlier about making these new traditions, well, also make some for yourself for when you haven't got them. Mm. So what are you going to do for you when you haven't got mm. the kids? Yeah, I think that's really important. Yeah. 
because all, all, all too often people go, right, I'm going to do this when I've got them, I'm going to do this when I've got them. And then when they haven't got them, they go, oh. You just feel the absence of them. Yeah, I'm just going to be this miserable. Empty space. Whereas, you know, yeah, it's finding something. Yeah. Saying, well, I'm, I'm not going to. I'm not just going to sit here and be miserable. I'm going to think about doing X, Y, and Z that I wouldn't be able to do perhaps if I had the children with me. Yeah. So yeah, yeah go away for to a nice hotel or something. You know, something that you wouldn't be able to do if you had the kids. Yeah, get the the, the time back that you wouldn't have had when you were a married couple, typically, um, and start to do the things for you again. So what would be your main advice to somebody that right now is going through a separation and is just at the very start of a co-parenting journey? Uh, trying to get it down to a few. Um, like we were just talking about language and communication, really, really important. Even down to little things like handovers. Mm. Don't call them handovers. Transitions. So it's uh, thinking about the language that you use. Um, and even down to things like transitions, uh, one tip that I always give to people very early on uh, is that actually take the children to the other parent. Because again, for very young children, a lot of that upset and again in those earlier days is feeling like they're being taken away mm -hmm. from one parent and if actually if you're delivering to the other parent uh, in that transition uh, that can help lessen the impact for children yeah um, again similarly to kind of language side of things is don't look at ways that you might possibly put your emotions into your child so even simple things like I miss I'm, I'll miss you mm -hmm. I'll miss you while you're at mummy's I'll miss you while you're at daddy's that's your emotion that you're putting into them to create a different experience for them so just think really consciously mm -hmm. about what and how you're saying things to people um, I think the final tip is don't expect that it will always be like this have some patience things will change um, and things will evolve as well uh, and give yourself a little bit of self-respect and also some self-reflection where what, where else could you approach these things differently what part are you playing in this process how could what you're doing lessen the negative connotations that are coming out of the experience and could, how could you be the one that leads by example really if you want to improve things how could you be the driving force in that that's absolutely fantastic advice, Tom. So thank you very much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you very much. You can find out more about all the work that Tom does supporting people going through a relationship breakdown at his website, mrdivorcecoach.co.uk. In the next episode, we'll be joined by Lottie Kent from True Financial Design as we take a look at how to take control of your finances on separation and protect yourself financially in the future. So that's it for this episode of Stowe Talks. Thanks for joining us. We hope you found it helpful and informative. If you would like more information on future videos, our podcast series and programme of webinars, head over to stowtalks.co.uk, where you can sign up for our email list, as well as check out our previous episodes and forthcoming events. And please do rate, like, share and review where you can. Thank you and see you next time.